said, my name is Rich Neumeister. When I was for the first time uh, had an heard about an opportunity to speak before your convention, at your convention, our convention, I'll also say that there's, a, I think, a little bit of libertarianism. If you're a Democrat, Republican, Independent, whatever. Right, so I think it's important to realize that. But the theme of your convention is live free. And one of the things that I want to talk about is how, how can you keep it free and to continue to keep it free because it is a challenge. Now, one of the things that as we have grown up, and we all remember our childhood, we want to do our own live free. But then our mom or dad or aunt, uncle or somebody says, don't you do that. Particularly, don't you do that, Rich. But then when you start becoming 11, 12, 13 years old, and like I did, starting sh uh, going down, being my own entrepreneur, shining shoes along University Avenue between Dale and Rice Street. And then all of a sudden in 1965 came go-go dancers. How many people have ever heard of the term go-go dancers? Okay. Well, all of a sudden I was told, Rich, you can't come here on Friday and Saturday nights anymore and spit shine shoes at 50 cents because of a new rule that basically said if you're going to have go-go dancers at the Gopher Bar in Virginia University. So that's a, a boundary that came into play. And so the thing is, is that when we are trying to live free, we have been running into boundaries in many different kinds of ways. Those are social boundaries, moral boundaries, and legal boundaries. Now, I deal a lot with the legal boundaries. And what those kinds of things are, or boundaries, that challenge our ability to live free, is we can either change them, reset them, also make boundaries when we know our ability to be free is in peril, or to get rid of them. As, depending on your own <coughs> personal opinion, the state legislature did, on the right for people to marry, no matter what their sexual preference is. That was a boundary, that was a moral, social, and legal boundary, but that has been reset, changed, and there is freedom, there's ability to live freedom. Now, for the last 37 years, for no money, I've been trying to live up to the point what Mark Twain said, and I'll say it in 2014 terms. No persons, life, liberty, or property are safe while the legislature is in session. You know that, I know that, by whatever kind of opinion you may have, you know that in each of your thoughts there has been a perspective and I couldn't be able to, be able to live free of regulation. Am I going to have a new, well, as over the last several decades has been attempts, if I'm a motorcyclist, am I going to have to mandatorily wear a helmet as an adult? Or all kinds of things are those kinds of questions. And those are the kinds of things that I want to be able to share with you that in order to live free, you need to keep it free by doing some of the things that I've suggested, by resetting, by changing, by making boundaries. Now remember, when you make boundaries, even though boundary can be a bad term, making boundaries is to make sure that your freedom is not encroached. I'm going to talk to you about a couple examples or something that where you might be able to get an idea of. Being at the legislature for as long as I have, there becomes an institutional memory and an understanding of how the process works. Now, in the mid-80s, there was a big issue of drug testing. Minnesota was one of the first states that said, we're going to have a law so private employers cannot just arbitrarily ask you to come in for a drug test. 
How many people would, would think an employer asking you to come in for a drug test without any guidelines is an encroachment on your freedom to live? How many people believe that? So what the government did, whether or not you think it's good, bad, or indifferent, they made a boundary. They made a boundary that says, and some rules, that if you're going to be drug tested, you're going to have to follow these rules. And one of the little pieces that I worked on that said if you are a private employer or employee and you are tested positive one time, basically you don't get kicked out. You don't lose your job if you choose not to go to rehabilitation. You get one bite at the end. In other words, you're found positive, you're willing to say, you know, you know whatever in your own way and you really mean it, go to, want to go to rehab, you have a right to do that as long as you complete whatever those plans are. That was a boundary placed on private action, which also goes against freedom. Another item. We've all heard about information and how information can have an impact on people's lives. And sometimes how information can have an impact on people's lives without you never ever being able to access the information. It's the whispering thing. It's the phone call or whatever. And that was happening to a lot of people. So myself went to a couple legislators and then also the FLCIO. Now remember, there are all kinds of groups. There's all kinds of groups that can work to be able to get legislation passed. And so we have a law. It's not the best law in the world. But once you get it on the books, you add on to it. So in 1989, there was a law that says you, as a private employee in the private sector, you have a right to get access to your personnel record. You have a right to challenge it, even though you're not part of a union, which a lot of union bargaining agreements allow, but you can do that, challenge it, and all that. You get, and as the law was on and the books added, number one, you get free copies of your personnel. You can do all kinds of things. Again, some aspect of freedom can be impinged on information. Don't you believe that you have a right to the information about you that may be being talked about to others or shared with other employers or whatever? A boundary was placed. Now one could go on and on with what those kinds of boundaries are, but one of the things that's been happening, because I wanted to tell you at least a little bit about the past, but some of the things that's happening now at the, le at the state legislature, is again challenging freedom, the ability to go places, the ability to do what you want to do without an idea or a fear of somebody doing something with that information. Because the bottom line is when legislators tell me, like the other day, a legislator says, Rich, you're paranoid. I don't believe in your paranoia on a particular bill, which was dealing with search warrants for cell phone location. I sort of said to her, look at our history. Look at the history of our country. Look at the history of this state in terms of how our privacy has been invaded. Whether it be with gang net, where 18,000 people were put on it with a Minnesota gang database because of the color of one's skin, or because you wore your hat a certain way, or you associated with somebody, you were put on a list. People found out about it, that's no longer around. Or another one, where Representative Mary Liz Holberg, with some of the people you may know, uh, who's now retiring, in 2003, found out that law enforcement in Minnesota and Northwestern Wisconsin, Western Wisconsin, had eight million file, eight million records on a couple million people. And people would say, well, I think Rich Neumeister is a suspect. Or someone else was a suspect. And you may have been the complainant. So all incident death. Well, we found out in 2003, 
that they weren't following a law called the Minnesota Government Data Practices Act, which is the privacy law or the law to be able to get public information. What happened when that was found out? The legislature, Rich Stanick, who lives in the area, now the sheriff of this county, the commissioner of public safety at that time, rather than save it, destroy it. So the things that are happening, we have to take a look. History repeats itself. Now, currently at the legislature, what we now have is LPR, license plate readers. Now, law enforcement was not going to tell you about license plate readers. They had maybe a little public uh, publicity thing about it in 2009, 2010. And they said, this is going to get after stolen cars. But we found out, particularly for people who were doing things and a big spread on the Star Tribune, that's more than that. That they're collecting millions of records of license plate scans, which is identifiable to a person who is innocent, more than likely, 99%, 99.3% are innocent and law-abiding people. We're also beginning to find out that they would like to centralize a great number of these records on innocent, law-abiding people. Thirdly, possibility of sharing them with the Federal, Homeland, Federal Department of Homeland Security. Third, thirdly, each local police department can come up with their own matching database of who they want to put, let's say, on the license plates. For example, if they wanted to do one, let's get a list of who are all the people that have a permit to carry. All right? And then they get those, and then and if those people have their names have a permit to carry, but also have a license plate with their car, you can manage. So let's say we want to get an idea of who's traveling at a certain location, at a certain time, at a certain event, who may have a permit to carry. Or, as Minneapolis has, they have certain things called BOLO. Be on the lookout for their own little database. How, who gets filled on Bobo? What's the criteria? They decide themselves. So the crux of a license plate bill, which is going to be before our conference committee, in the next week, because the legislature ends. <laughs> is, is how long are they going to keep the license plate scans on innocent and law-abiding people? Not a hit. A hit is usually what you know the database they pair up so they might do it with warrants they might do it with people who are being looked for might be people who might hold back back taxes i don't think not yet but you know license plate readers could be used for almost anything child support or whatever and so the thing is is that that's one of the big issues another issue of it should they put it before should they let's say Law enforcement believe that the Libertarian Party, at their convention here in Maple Grove, might be mm, suspicious. <laughs> I'm not saying it's going to happen, but it can. Just recently in Florida, at an air, at an air fest, the police department put their license plate readers, and they knew of everybody who came in and out. See, those are the kinds of things that's important to be aware of. Now, uh, I encourage, how many people have ever gone to the state legislature? Okay. Hopefully next year, those, if you all come here, you'll, you'll rise by triple or four times. So, I mean, you can still put in another item. How many people have heard of the Stingray? The car? Not the car. <laughs> stingray. Kingfish. Okay, Kingfish. Well, as you may know, and if you can all tell me how many minutes I have left, I thought I had about 20 to do the, to do the thing, so I don't want to impose. I don't want to impose on you, Mr. Swan. Or, but the, one of the things that happened since 2001, there's been a lot of Homeland Security money going to all the locals, local, state, whatever. And one of them, with, their new, with new tech toys and with technology, and that's also the challenge issue of technology is people are getting more toys, law enforcement is getting more toys. 
One of them was called the Kingfish that Hennepin County got in 2010. They got $310,000 or something like that of the grant. It was approved. Nobody heard anything about it. And they were doing their, their, their deal with it. There's a guy by the, if you're a Twitter follower, there's a guy by the name of Hamlet, at Hong Kong, or Dan Fight, who does a lot of good stuff. Uh, tweeted a lot about it and did a lot of things about it. But it was just back almost in September of this year, of last year, they've been hearing about this little thing called Stingray, which is the big brother of the Kingfish. And what a king, Kingfish and the Stingray does is basically finds out, emits radio waves, <coughs> signals, strong signals, and they mimic a cell phone. So what happens is it goes out and searches for, you know, whenever your cell phone is on and going, it searches so they, they'll search your home, search your pocket, search where you may be. So over the last several months, there's been a lot of issues about it. It's been in the newspaper. We found out that the state of Minnesota, the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, spent $600,000 on it since 2005. No legislator knew about it. There's no little spending thing for Stingray. So that's created a buzz at the legislature. And one of the things that has created the buzz is where now there's a bill that will regulate by, it went in as a bill to, for a search warrant. A search warrant would be needed. The highest protection of a Fourth Amendment, which we've all been told is the highest protection for search and seizure and for the invasion of privacy by law enforcement and government. Well, the process went through. Now on the Senate side, you have a tracking warrant. Law enforcement doesn't want the words search warrant in the bill. I'll tell you why in a second. On the House side, it's probable cause court order. But one of the main reasons why they don't want a search warrant is because of all the case law that's been developed by what the term search warrant is. Search warrant means search and seizure of you as a person. They do not want to recognize your right to privacy and that it's an unreasonable search. Well, any of the lawyers in here, I'm not a lawyer, but I like to read law is the Katz decision of 1967 that basically said, that's why we have all these more regulations on wiretaps since 68. The reason why is it can be an unreasonable search and seizure. Law enforcement Minnesota, and I've been hearing inklings about from the governor now, is that they don't want search warrant worded in the bill because of all that case law, that specificity, that particular arity, specifics that they need for a judge can sort of say when the stingray goes out with its signals <laughs> and I'll give you an example let's say a stingray right here it's like a little box in a car let's say they're searching for me even though I've never had a cell phone in terms of owning one I use it sometimes for work which they can all your information would be collected looking for that one target that's an invasion just like the license plate uh, probably what for sure on this one 99.999 and they're looking for one generally of law of law abiding and innocent people so that's the fight what's going to be happening now at the conference committee it's going to be search warrant or it's going to be watered down and we'll see uh there's been you know if you put stingray kingfish in the newspaper uh, a reporter from the star tribune probably be a story on that in the next couple of days so these are things that are happening at, at, at a local level, and you have to decide whether or not you are interested to, 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 continue, to get involved. For me, uh, I think it's important. But it, it takes more than just one person. And on a lot of these things, it can be one person, but it also has to be a legislator has an interest. It's also, like for example, when I did things on the drug testing and the <coughs> personal records, I did with PFL Seattle. They weren't just concerned about their union members. Maybe they are now, I don't know, but I'm just saying, you know, when I 
We were wanting to get rights for workers just in general. When I deal with medical records and the privacy, because there was an attempt by the council, Minnesota Council of Health Plans, to take away your right to consent. In Minnesota, we have stronger medical rights to where you can direct where your medical information goes than HIPAA. But the Council of Health Plans say, for efficiency of health care, we need to get your ability to where your particular record wants to go. You don't want your mental health record to go to uh, a certain person, or if you about your knee, you don't want it to go to your psychiatrist, you don't have to. But now, they want everything. And so that's an issue. That was uh, Twyla Brace. How many people have heard of Twyla Brace with health? I mean, I work with her. I may disagree with her on some other things. That's why I was saying libertarianism. It's not just, it's all over. Tommy Rukavina. How many people have heard of Tom Rukavina? From the Iron Range, legislator for decades. He always called himself, you know what? I'm a VFL libertarian liberal, or something like that. You even had two people here today from the Republican Party. Brandon Peterson and Jim Abel. So I think it's important to realize that you've got to work with all kinds of folks and all that. But what I want to leave with you uh, this evening, and then if there is some time for a question or two, uh, it's useful from time to time to think about the reach of legislative power because it is powerful, particularly in those four or five, four or five months when they're in every year from January. And like I said, Thank God there's a constitutional provision that says they're out by, I think it's the third Monday of each year. It's also important that the legislature creates the machinery and the mission for many of things of state power. It does the regulatoriness, also the undertaking. Now, we've all heard of those folks called lobbyists. Even though I was referred to as um, someone who lobbies, sometimes I'm referred to as a lobbyist. But there's a difference. I am not a paid advocate. And the other thing that one has to do and understand is that those paid people at the state legislature do not represent the myriad numbers of groups and people affected by the legislator's actions. You know, there have been at times I've been sitting in a committee and I hear about something and I'm out there testifying. That's the other aspect I want to leave with you tonight and why I never went to Washington, D.C. when I had the opportunity to do so. I can make a hell of a difference more here than I can in Washington, D.C. I can do it more on my local city council level than I can in D.C. So, the other thing, and this is a fact from my perspective, is that many interests have no lobbyists. With, in its own way, very much distorts the way of what maybe good public policy should be. So, in my comments and in my overview, I've tried to share with you at least some aspects of where if you're going to live free, you can keep it free, but you are someone who's you're going to have to do it, because if you don't, who will? And Mr. Chairman, other folks, I want to thank you very much for the opportunity to make comments, and if there's a, if there, if you want to ask any questions or so, if there is time, we'll open to them. I think it, it comes from the basic thing of asking the question. If there is something that tees you off, or how many people have seen the uh, movie Network? <laughs> movie Network. Mad as hell. Mad as hell. First of all, you find out just some basic information about it. Secondly, you call up your legislator, or sort of something like that. 
because one of the things that is very important, questions begin questions, and when there's more of questions, there's more of issues that come into, into play and to rise. I mean, I'll, I'll just give you an example. I have seen little things in state laws that, for example, back in 1997, I saw where there was $400,000 in a writing, just like a little paragraph in the spending bill, to be spent on an investigative database. I found out more about it. Well, it was the beginning of a big gang database with no protections for privacy. It could have kept the information forever or whatever. I've now seen that same thing in a little bill that was just change of language. Again, you don't come with this overnight, but that's why it's important to talk to other people. ACLU, Libertarians for Liberty, I mean the Institute for uh, Justice, I mean they just did a great thing on the administrative forfeiture, the game strike, strike task force. So the thing is, it has to, you have to have some, you know, people aren't going to come, the legislators not going to come knock on your door, tell us. You know, it's the same thing about this, all this privacy for Stingray cell phone location. Cops have had this technology for almost 10 years. They're not going to be knocking on the legislature's door. We want you to make it harder for us. You know, so I think that's, you need a little bit of, mm, you need some good questioning. And you don't have to do like I do. I mean, there is a sacrifice. I've sacrificed some things. I've never had a car. No cell phone. Uh, you know, things like that. So I hope that's answered uh, as some aspect of it. Well, as they say, laws are made by those who show up <laughs> and stay late. So hopefully in uh, this first of an opportunity that I've ever had to do something like this before the group, I hope that uh, you take at least something uh, from my little comments and from the convention today. Thank you very much.